And up next, we're going to be changing the atmosphere a little bit to a different topic, uh, something very interesting in terms of digital disruption. So we're going to be discussing education and the effect that technology is having on that field. So we have an expert who will share her perspective with the topic of 100 languages. Please give a warm round of applause to welcome our honored speaker, CEO of Hello Ruby, Ms. Linda Liukas. Hi everyone, my name is Linda. I'm not a startup entrepreneur. I'm a children's book author, I'm an illustrator, and I'm a programmer. And my profession is telling stories about the world of software. Because if there's one message we've heard throughout these days, it is that every company of the future will be a software company. So I write storybooks, traditional old school storybooks about the world of technology and stories to educate the youngest of us on how technology can be a wonderful, whimsical and colorful career for everyone. And this is where I started from. From the idea that if coding is truly the next universal language, instead of grammar classes, we ought to be teaching poetry lessons. And what I mean with that is the idea that instead of practicing a language by only its rules, we don't learn uh, Thai or English or Finnish like that. We need to learn to use a language. We need to use a language by singing it, by dancing it, by uh, writing it. And in the same way, even though coding is not a natural language, we ought to diversify the ways we teach it. And even though we live in this era where there are so many different ways to learn to code, there definitely was something that was missing for me in these ways we educate the youngest of us. And that thing that was missing was stories. Because in some ways, stories have always been the way we humans learn about ourselves. We learn about each other, and we learn about the world surrounding us. And no one was really telling stories about the world of software. So that's what I do. I write storybooks about how computers work, how computers talk to each other, how the internet works, how machine learning and AI ought to be explained for six-year-olds. And the books have been widely popular. They've been translated into over 28 languages so far. And today, I'm really happy to announce the 29th language, and that is Thai. So together with Nanmi Books, we're bringing Hello Ruby Books to the Thai public. Uh, all of the four books will be translated, the first two already this year. So I'm hoping to see these books in bookstores and widely in use in schools in the future. And today, I wanted to share you a few lessons I've learned making technology approachable for the next generation. Because I don't think we're only teaching kids to code. I think what we're actually doing is preparing kids for a world where more and more of the problems around us are computer problems. And we need a radically more diverse group of people to get excited about computers as tools of self-expression to solve these problems. And one of the most unfortunate things computer science has done to itself, it, it is to call itself computer science, because it makes us think about computers. And that's an easy mistake to make, because when we think about biology, we think about someone who studies the biological world. And when we think about physics, we think about someone who studies the physical world. So when we think about a computer scientist, it's easy to think that a computer scientist is someone who studies the computer, often alone, very mathematically, and so forth. But that's not true. A computer scientist is someone who uses the computer to study the big problems in the world, those of energy, nutrition, health, education. And as a result, computer science is a tool of problem solving, a tool of self-expression. So I'm going to really quickly walk you through the A, B, and C of technology education the way I see it. And A, obviously, is for the word algorithm. With the children, we practice the word algorithm by giving each other sequences of instructions. So the other kid is the computer, the other kid is the programmer, and the computer's role is to give the computer instructions on how to brush your teeth. And we run into many different kinds of problems, like how do you define what a toothbrush is? And by the time you've gotten the toothbrush to your mouth, you remember that there's the toothpaste. And what happens to the cap of the toothpaste when you already have your other hand um, 
holding the tooth, um, uh, toothbrush. And as a result, the children learn that computer science is not lonely. You work collaboratively, you work together through problems. We even have a special word for it, it's called pair programming. They learn that computer science is all about making mistakes, but having the persistence to go in and fix those mistakes. It's called debugging, no one writes perfect code at the get-go. And then the final thing they learn is creativity. We think that computer science is only logical, only mechanical, only one answer fits everything. But really, coding is highly creative, it's messy, it's beautiful, and there's a lot of creativity to put into the way we solve problems. So when we think about the word algorithm, what it really means is a step-by-step -step instruction to solving a problem. And the power of algorithms can be told through the metaphor of a cupcake recipe. Because you can make one cupcake with a cupcake recipe, but of course you would rather use it to make a hundred cupcakes or maybe even a thousand cupcakes. And that is the power of an algorithm. Once written out, you can repeat it endlessly over and over again to solve all the problems in the world. And when we think about an algorithm, we often think that it's somehow magic. But it's not. Humans write algorithms. And for the kids, I often show these five numbers, and I ask them to put them in order of magnitude, starting from the smallest, ending in the biggest. And it takes kids roughly two to three minutes to solve this problem. And then I ask them to order these numbers, and then these numbers, and the kids say, oh, there are so many of them. And I tell them, lesson number one, never compete with a computer on a task like this. Because computers will always be far faster, far better at solving problems like this. They will make far less mistakes, and they will outperform humans on tasks like this. But they still need the instructions from us humans. And the way a computer would approach a problem like this is, for instance, like this. It would start from the beginning, it would compare 1 and 56, it would say 56 is bigger than 1, let's keep it like that. It would compare 56 and 4, say 56 is smaller than 4, let's swap these around. It would move on to 56 and uh, 70, say, hmm, this looks okay. And then it would move on to 70 and 20 and say, hmm, let's swap these two around. And then it would move all the way to the beginning and repeat this sequence over and over and over again until the numbers were organized. This is called bubbles or algorithm. It's one of the working horses of computer science, still wildly popular today. But it was written by a human. But this is not the only thing algorithms are. Because algorithms are slowly entering our societies and changing the way we see the world. I show children a search engine, I ask where is the algorithm hiding? And we talk about how ads, they are again a sequence of instructions someone wrote to show you relevant advertisement based on your browsing history, your location, your gender. And we talk about the results, in uh, the order in which the results are shown on the page. And then we talk about social networking sites, how it's not an accident uh, that the order in which you see the updates from your friends drive retention and drive you staying for a longer time on the site. That's an algorithm someone wrote to maximize the time you spend on these services. And then finally, we talk about YouTube. And we figure out that the suggested videos uh, are defined by an algorithm. The automatic text fill-in is that's defined by an algorithm. But more and more, also the kinds of videos that get produced on YouTube, those are defined by an algorithm. So if anyone here has seen these really weird mashup videos like surprise Play-Doh, eggs, Peppa Pig, Pocoyo, Minecraft videos, those are done by an algorithm. Because every one hour, there's every one minute, there's 400 hours of new content uploaded on YouTube. And there's no way a human can go through all of that data, so we need an algorithm. And more and more, the content is not done for our six-year-olds. It's done and optimized for the algorithm to pick it out and uh, show it to the rest of the world. And this is the scary side of algorithms. When they start to influence the way we see the world, the kind of content our youngest see. And this is why it's so important to make the abstract concept of an algorithm approachable for different kinds of people. And this brings to me to the B, which is for Boolean logic.
And I absolutely love computers, but I'm also a little bit angry for the computer scientists because in the past 30 to 40 years, they've made computers very foreign to us. In the 70s, you could still touch a transistor. Nowadays, you can jam 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. But there's no way of explaining how computers work anymore. There's no way of peeking inside. There's no way of walking inside of a computer and figuring out what it actually does unless you're a children's book author. So that's what happens in the next Ruby book where Ruby goes into dad's office. She types her password in, but the computer doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the white mouse, it wakes up next to Ruby and says, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor. Can you help me find the cursor? And Ruby says, of course, I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And together they make themselves very, very small. And they fall deep, deep, deep inside of the computer to the layer of electricity. Where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off, on and off. And they could find the cursor here, but Ruby says, let's climb higher. And they find the logic gates that take these tiny bits and do a little bit more complex mathematical operators, operations with the bits, but still at the level of elementary school math. And then they climb higher, and they meet the CPU of the computer that is really good at bossing everyone else round, but really forgetful, so it needs help from the RAM and the ROM and the mass storage. And they do meet the operating system of the computer, and they do finally also find the cursor. You'll need to wait for the Thai edition to come out to figure out how. But more importantly, I think the kids get a very robust experience of how electricity turns into logic, how logic turns into hardware, how hardware turns into software, and how software turns into the apps, games, and uh, so, um, uh, applications we use every single day. And as a result, I hope that the kids understand that while computers are magical, they are not made of magic, they are made of logic. So why does this matter? Because this is the last generation that will remember the computer defined by a keyboard, a screen, and a mouse. The next generation is already having discussions with a computer, and there's hundreds of computers in every home, ranging from your microwave oven to your doorbell to your toothbrush to your teddy bear. And we really need to start updating the metaphors we use to talk about computers and computing. So one of my favorite activities is this one where I give kids a little on-off sticker and I tell them that this afternoon you can make anything in this room into a computer by putting this sticker on it. And one little girl, she chooses a bicycle lamp and she says, Linda, if this bicycle lamp was a computer, we could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent. And this bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. And that's the moment I'm looking for. When the kid understands that technology is about imagination, it's about seeing something other people don't see, and it's about being part of that change. And odds are, it's not that important for our next generation to learn to code or master one or two or several programming languages. As a parent, what I would pay attention to is helping the kids understand what a computer does well and what a human does well, giving them a robust mental model of the computer. And that brings us to the final letter, which stands for C, creativity, and computers. And it starts with artificial intelligence and machine learning, two words we've heard so many times today. And often when we talk about AI and machine learning, we get this sense of medieval monsters that were kind of trying to uh, coax into living. Some adults think about the Skynet and the Terminator. And that means we're moving our own prejudices and fears to the next generation. And that's not fair. Because already now there are so many different kinds of intelligences we humans have, ranging from being able to learn new languages, to being able to dance really well, to being able to make friends really well. And the idea that the narrow artificial intelligence would be able to take over all these different kinds of intelligences of human is just preposterous. AI is not only about robots. It's about the data we produce and package into services. So we shouldn't be talking about killer robots, we should be talking about data. 
And even though we say that with machine learning, computers are getting the ability to see, to communicate, to move, to reason, and to create, what we're actually doing is applying a very narrow technology into different disciplines and fields. And that technology is based on data. So when we want a computer to learn to play Go, we feed it hundreds of thousands of examples of Go games. When we want a computer to learn to drive a car, we give it examples of uh, driving um, environments. When we want the computer to suggest videos for us, we need to feed it examples of likes. And when we want a toy to be able to recognize our speech, we need to find somewhere hundreds of thousands of hours of kids' speech. And in the past, if we were to teach a computer to recognize a cat, we would have needed to write these very, very exact instructions on cats, like cats have two ears, a tail, and they come in these five colors. And these instructions would be extremely brittle and break down easily. What we do nowadays instead is we give uh, computers examples. Well, so we humans gather a lot of examples of cats. The computer builds a model out of those cats. Maybe it looks at the distinction between the ears and the eyes. We don't exactly know how a computer recognizes a cat. And then it gives an answer. But very importantly, it doesn't only give an answer. It gives an estimate, a prediction, a probability. And we still need humans to decide what kind of problems we want the computer to solve and where we still need human interference. Because there's areas in our judicial system, in our healthcare system, where we don't want the computers to be making all the choices for us. So this whole uh, continuum of machine learning, it might feel that there's no room for humans, but actually there is. The problems we set to solve, the kinds of answers we take, and the kind of data we gather. And with the children, we practice this. I show them four pictures of cats, and I ask them, so we're trying to teach the computer to recognize a cat. What kind of a bias might the computer get because it only sees these cats as the training data? And the kids say, hmm, the computer might think all cats are gray. And I say, yes, now draw a picture of a, um, of, of a um, brown cat with uh, blue eyes. And then I show them a picture of a teacup, and again I ask, what is the bias in this picture? Would this computer recognize grandma's teacup with the flowers on it, or a Japanese teacup that doesn't have a handle? No. And these examples sound innocent, but as we are automating more and more of our society, I think it's really important that we pay attention to the training data we offer to our um, machine learning system so that we don't accidentally create a system that only thinks nurses are women. And the earlier we start to engage all kinds of people in this process with multiple different backgrounds, the better AI we will be able to create. And we practice with kids. Here on the left-hand side, you see a kid who tried to explain to the computer what a happy person looks like. You can see that in Finland, we have a high problem in that all of our training data tends to be of people with blue eyes and um, blonde skin. That's a problem. And here's a Singaporean little girl who wanted to teach the computer to recognize a unicorn. And she was fiercely proud of the last picture where she drew a picture of a unicorn from the behind. So this is a very good machine learning system. Finally, I would pay attention with the next generation on teaching them what is easy for a human, what is easy for a machine, what is hard for both of us, because we have very different skills. And these skills are important because our world is changing so rapidly. A few months ago, I read this study from um, Cambridge University where the professors had shown pictures to children. They had two set of pictures. One set of pictures had pictures of natural world items like trees and animals and plants. The other set of pictures had pictures of Pokemon species. And by far, the kids were much better at recognizing the Pokemon. They had much more vocabulary to describe Pikachu than the birch tree. They were better at recognizing Bulbasaur than the badger. And the researchers were worried because what happens when we don't have language to describe what is happening around us? And I'm worried about the natural world, but I'm also worried about the technological world, where we have so many of these suitcase words, these words we throw one, one, from one person to another, we never open them. Words like an algorithm, Bitcoin, blockchain, DDoS attack. And we really need to start updating these metaphors and these stories. One time a little boy asked me, Linda, is internet a place? 
And I told him, no, no, internet is not a place. Internet is a connected uh, group of servers around the world. It's like the cyber village. It's like the information superhighway. You go surfing online. And then I realized I sound like a kid of the 1990s. This child has never pressed the disconnect button. The internet is everywhere around him, invisible, part of his life. So should I start by explaining to him that the internet is these fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to the space, or these servers that store the data about us? Or should I talk to him about that data, how there's software and protocols that define how the data travels eight times around the world in one second? Or should I talk to him about all of the creativity, all of the cat videos and Gagnon styles and the explosion of creativity that happens when the six billion of us are finally connected? And this is the challenge of teaching technology. It's not only hardware, it's not only software, and it's not only the societal impact technology is having. Our curriculum and pedagogy need to be teaching all three at the same time. So I'll leave you with this. When you see a child totally enchanted by their computer, imagine for a moment that it's not a computer. It's a magic wand, it's a guitar, it's a telescope, it's a treasure finder, and anything the child can imagine. Thank you very much.